On a basic level, democracy sounds very simple. It's a system of government in which power is exercised by the people. But like all things, it's more complicated than that. Do you vest power directly into the hands of the people or govern through representation? And just because someone is elected doesn't mean they can have all power or they might just do however they please. Democratic societies throughout history have therefore come up with mechanisms and systems that are put in place to prevent tyranny, separation of powers, term limits, separate government institutions, government transparency, separately elected chambers of government, regional governments, free press, freedom to assembly, arming the people, and if you are a constitutional monarchy, you can also build an ideal of democracy into the royal traditions and institutions of your state with the monarch as a guarantor of political freedoms. Republicans often like to call this a violation of the principle of governance through the people by its existence of a hereditary class distinction and power structure, to which constitutional monarchists will respond by pointing out that in recent history only three constitutional monarchies collapsed into tyranny compared to all the republics that collapsed into various unpleasant forms of governance. That debate aside, there is a common agreement of preventing the abuse of power, a guarantee of individual freedoms and preservation of democratic rule, something called liberal democracy. But is it necessary? Some movements argued we do not need these measures of safety and barriers to protect and ensure the change of power and security of individual liberties that most democratic societies adhere to, and they have mostly failed. But it is still a resurging line of thought, one aptly named by the Hungarian Gulish Putin as illiberal democracy, the idea of a partial democracy which acknowledges a vote but leaves it at that. There is no accountability to the public and it is limited to the delivery of basic needs. The idea that people are not self-determined, motivated by their convictions and beliefs, but mere lemmings in the need of guidance. A question remains though if you give up on the ideals of protecting individual liberty from arbitrary government interference in life, economy and culture, is what do you replace it with? Majoritarianism is the philosophical idea that being the majority of a population should come with privileges and entitlements that are exclusive and unavailable or harder to attain for minorities, and that what benefits a majority takes precedence no matter at what cost it may come to a minority. It's a nice way of saying might makes right, and majoritarianism lies at the core of Viktor Orban's understanding of how a society should be run. Orban asked his followers and party to abandon the notion of the 1989 peaceful revolution, the end of communism and the founding of the Hungarian Republic as being the foundation upon which a Hungarian society was built, instead proclaiming that a nationalist myth of Hungarians as a 1,000-year-old Catholic nation and people were the foundation upon which a Hungarian society was, will and should be built. In short, a united cultural Hungarian identity of a Hungarian majority in a Hungarian land. This idea, however, quickly runs into problems. During the Protestant Reformation, Hungarians almost completely abandoned Catholicism and turned to Protestantism. Hungary, however, became a majority Catholic nation again, not by choice, but by the sword. When during the 17th century, the Austrians decided that Hungary should be stripped of any autonomy and ruled as a conquered territory, imposing Austrian overrule, reimposing a Catholic nobility and treating Hungarians as inferior subjects of an empire whose sovereignty came out of being governed through the Catholic God's grace. Orban's vision of what Hungarian ought to be and what the majority Hungarian identity which the state ought to serve should be leaves the significant Protestant minority on the sidelines, just as it does the country's Jews, non-religious, Roma, Sinti, Ruthenians, Serbs, Romanians, Slovaks, gays, lesbians and other minorities who do not have a place amongst the chosen people of the majority society. More significantly though, only 29% of Hungarians see Christianity as part of their national identity. A majoritarian rule based on some arbitrary chosen identity is therefore exposed as being null and void. The vision of a unified Catholic Hungarian national identity is nonsense. The country has a large plurality of thought, beliefs, faith and languages. Arbitrarily selecting one of these sets of beliefs as the domineering group above all others is at best cronyism and at worst exclusionary. Hungary's history is also not a history of a thousand-year nation, but a long, complex story of nomadic horsemen, Polish kings, Ottoman conquest, Austrian betrayal, 400 years of Austrian imperial occupation, fascism, communism, 50 years of Russian subjugation, and above all, revolution after revolution, rebellion after rebellion, dating back to medieval peasant uprisings. The jingoism around this is also batshit and laughable. When Orban was elected, he used the large powers granted to him 
him through an absolute elected majority to rewrite the constitution of the Hungarian Republic to reflect his vision, adding, God bless the Hungarians, we take pride in our king Saint Stephen I who built the Hungarian state a thousand years ago, and even added the crown jewels of the long gone Hungarian monarchy into the constitution, which he had then moved from the Hungarian National Museum to the parliament building to be guarded by the Republican Guard. The illiberal democracy of Hungary is a Catholic nation that has no Catholic majority, a pluralist nation with only room for one group, and a republic that worships a monarchy. Imagine if some twat rewrote the US Constitution to add at its beginning a soppy poem singing the praises of King George. The cuts into the state's structure go even deeper than that. The Hungarian Supreme Court was changed from being an independent institution to an institution in service of the Prime Minister. A press authority was created, a government institution with the authority to fine and penalize media outlets and journalists at will, the members of the board being appointed by the Prime Minister. And lastly, the Hungarian Republic used to have an independent fiscal council, an institution unique to the Hungarian Republic. Imagine a sort of supreme court for the national budget that could intervene whenever a government made a dangerously unbalanced budget decision or when the national debt would be raked up too high. Orban disbanded this organization. All these drastic changes to the institutions of the state were done to ensure the success of the majoritarian society, but in the end they only accomplished a corrupt oligarchy with neither government nor public oversight to Rain in on them. The Turkish Republic is somewhat of a soft spot in many a liberal circle across the world as the supposed prevailer of liberal democratic values in the Islamic world. And wrongfully so. The story of the Turkish Republic is a story drenched in blood, violence, discrimination, oppression and the worst genocide in the history of the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire that preceded the Republic spent its last 100 years gradually collapsing into itself as more and more of its imperial subjects struggled for and gained independence, all the while bashing the Armenians and Arabs to not dare do the same. The group of intellectuals and officers that came to dominate the debate on if the empire could be saved or what should follow it was called the Young Turks. And the Young Turks wanted a newly reformed modern state for the Turks. The landmass they had, however, included a few million Armenians, Arabs, Assyrians and Greeks. Their visions for the future ranged from removing all these to an all-encompassing Turkish empire, stretching from the Balkans to China for Turkish people. None of these visions of the future, however, had a place for all those non-Turks within their realm. So in the end, they resorted to what must have seemed to them to be the simplest solution for having non-Turkish people in a state that should exist only for Turks. They slaughtered them in the millions and ethnically cleansed the land from the Bosporus to the Euphrates in what would go down as the worst genocide in the history of the Middle East. That blood-soaked stain has been deeply drained into the Turkish Republic and the mentality of its institutions since, and not just because people denied that it ever happened. The project of the Turkish Republic was to create a Europeanized secular state for a Turkish people and a Turkish people only. An ethnically monomorphic state, one people, one culture, one language, language one race, an ethno-republic. There was and is no place in this republic for anyone else, and that authoritarian bent could be felt throughout the republic's history. Secularization was forced, even though on principle a society that forces women to not wear the veil is no better than a society that forces them to wear the veil. The state was continuously undermined by military dictatorship after dictatorship. To this day, the Turkish Republic enforces Article 301, a law punishing the insulting of Turkishness, a legal passage so vague it can be interpreted by judges to mean anything from advocating for minority rights, speaking Kurdish in government institutions, proclaiming the historic reality of the Armenian genocide, criticizing Turkish nationalism, to exposing corrupt politicians. So when Erdogan rolled into power with an authoritarian Islamist vision for the Republic, there were no democratic institutions for him to undermine, no safeguards of democracy for him to dismantle, only the framework of an illiberal democracy whose previous guardians had lost support by the public. And he didn't need to do much more but creep into power, insert an Islamist vision for a now ethnically and due to discrimination removal of minorities, also religiously unison society. The lesson to be learned here is that when you build an authoritarian state to enforce your ideology as an authoritarian, you also make it easier for other authoritarians to creep in and take over once you are pushed out of power. <laughs>
Iran is a perfect example of how religion can not only poison a country's government, but society and culture. Iran is a diverse and multicultural nation, in which only 50% of the population is Persian. The rest are the various ethnic groups of the vast borderlands that surround the Persian heartland. Throughout history, the Persians would remedy this by implementing saprites, small kingdoms and provinces ruled by governors and smaller kings who were granted great autonomy in exchange for allegiance and fealty to the Persian king. Hence the title of the Persian king being King of Kings. However, with the arrival of Islam came a new unit unifying force of Shia Islam, which in 1979 came to be the glue that kept this regime together. A government who proclaims to have a responsibility to God and not to its people is a nightmarish vision. No matter how much Iran may proclaim to be democratic, it makes no difference who you vote for, as those the people vote for merely act under the constraints of God's most loyal servants. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard, a state within a state accountable only to God and serves the role of an inquisition in which one rises through the ranks by ever-increasing fanaticism. Theocracies are a recipe for disaster. Having a supposed choice between different brands of insanity is still a choice for insanity. Opposition can never be tolerated in a place where it is seen as an act of defiance against God, and the people themselves are merely an expandable resource in service of God. This is a state in which its people are nothing but a mere sinful flesh who are condemned to being the playthings of those who proclaim to be of lesser sin. Any and all Islamic states are the same in spirit no matter how much an attempt is made to disguise such. Venezuela and Bolivia are two countries that gradually replaced the institutions of their state with Marxist doctrine. Proclaiming to do so in the name of liberation, both countries embarked on a massive social experiment. Changes to the Constitutional Assembly, Supreme Court, elected bodies and the constitutions were made to free respective governments from institutional oversight. The institutions in place to oversee and check the government's actions were seen as a burden in the way of greater social reform and liberation. The widely enacted social reforms came under the name of a Bolivarian revolution in Venezuela that even wrote mandatory social spending into the constitution, a ground-up reform of society on the basis of class upheaval. In Bolivia, Evo Morales, the first Native American president of a South American country, based his changes to the state on the basis of the liberation of oppressed people under an anti-imperialist social justice, in a way turning the concept of Auburn's majoritarianism on its head, declaring special privileges and rights for indigenous peoples in a minority system. These eliminations of institutions supposed to oversee the democratic liberties of a country, however, only contributed to a collapse of those countries into tyranny and poverty. Nobody was left to prevent disastrous economic decisions in Venezuela that flung the once most prosperous nation of Latin America into poverty. The Bolivian Republic had term limits on the presidency, but Evo Morales simply ignored them, and the institutions meant to prevent him from doing so had been stripped of the authority to do so. The proclamations of socialist liberation and solidarity in the end were exposed to be nothing but a sham to keep themselves in power, as more and more opposition members and journalists ended up in prison. There is nothing wrong with social policies that involve public spending to alleviate the poverty of a nation. These two countries, however, enshrined socialist policy as a supposed principle of governance at the cost of not only their country's wealth, but also liberty. However, on the scale of countries that abandoned liberal democracy, there's a country with a government that is such a sham, such an obvious fraud of a dysfunctional and kleptocratic state that exists for no purpose, that in any way serves its people, that it can't even be said to have any kind of philosophical excuse for its existence. Belarus, Europe's last dictatorship, is in a category of its own in terms of how much of a dumpster fire it is. The country declared its independence from the Soviet Union in 1990, four years later riding a wave of Soviet nostalgia, Alexander Lukashenko was elected president. Two years later, he rewrote the constitution, taking all powers from government bodies and giving them to himself. And three years after that, the leaders of the opposition just disappeared and are by now presumed to be dead. In absence of any opposition and future opposition leaders facing similar fates, Lukashenko built a weird state that has to be seen to be believed. It's a place in which it's almost like the Soviet Union never stopped to exist. Old Soviet 
Soviet cars, state-owned collectivized kolkhoz farms, massive state-owned industry complexes that seem to be falling apart, red army parades, medals for workers, Soviet symbols, hammers and sickles, red stars, a militarized iron curtain border, and even the name of the country's intelligence service is the KGB. But it's not a socialist state. There is no socialist doctrine behind any of this. This is not a communist country. Its policies are aggressively nationalist and the ideal of social progress is frowned upon. The country, weirdly enough, sees the Soviet husk it maintains from the past as some sort of weird traditionalist conservative maintaining of Soviet social structure. The conservative call to go back to the traditional old days in Belarus simply means back to the social stagnation of the 1980s Soviet Union. And even that is not the purpose of the state, it's therefore not even a nostalgia state if one could even call it that. In speech after speech, the Belarusian president proclaims that the purpose of Belarus is to be the fortress between Russia and NATO, the vanguard protecting Russia from a European homosexual agenda, and to serve Russia and its security interests. The state's purpose boils down to being Russia's dog toy and hoping to never become the next Ukraine. Most illiberal democracies give ideological excuses as the justification for their abolition of democratic safeguards, but Belarus doesn't even have any of that. It's probably therefore the best symbol of how an illiberal democracy in the end is just a crony state.